Many biology courses survey life on Earth, and very often the place to begin is with the smallest of living things, uh, the bacteria or prokaryotic cells. Now, um, there are many reasons to start uh, small, simply you know, for simplicity, obviously. Um, but also because they represent the most abundant living things on Earth in terms of number. So, for example, if you were to just go to a wetland, I believe this study was done in Maryland, and just take a milliliter of water, just a sample, you would get um, billions of viruses and hundreds of millions of bacteria. And if you were to ask, is that something weird about uh, Maryland? The answer would be no. Uh, because there is simply an incredible number of uh, microbes uh, around us. And so the world is full of bacteria. They are the most abundant uh, living things on uh, the planet, uh, which is one of uh, the reasons uh, you know, that uh, we could study them. As I'll be mentioning uh, presently, um, they are found in environments where we wouldn't automatically think that life exists. We would say, oh, this environment is too hot, or there's too much pressure, or it's too acidic, or it's too salty. But nevertheless, um, microbes uh, can uh, be found there with bacteria uh, being, once again, the most abundant living thing on Earth. Now, um, this uh, video was focusing on the number of separate individuals, and uh, bacteria are unicellular. Um, but we could also then um, ask uh, how uh, much of Earth's uh, life is composed of bacteria um, by weight. Now, uh, plants, uh, given the trunks of trees and the uh, great expanse of uh, forests, um, they represent uh, the greatest amount of Earth's biomass. So if you were to uh, estimate Earth's biomass, you know, viruses make up this um, uh, much, and uh, we're looking at gigatons and uh, in the range of say one to two gigatons. Um, but notice that animals um, were uh, only about uh, double that. So notice if you were to weigh all of the animals on Earth, um, which would include uh, the arthropods, uh, which are the most uh, abundant uh, animals, um, it wouldn't be that you know, significant compared to the number of uh, viruses. If uh, you were to go uh, on, and obviously this uh, video that I'm presenting now just kind of overviews all of uh, the others, um, notice that protists outweigh the animals, um, that fungi outweigh the protists. Um, but there are two kinds of bacteria, as I will um, uh, say uh, presently. There are the archaea, uh, and then there are the U bacteria, the true bacteria. Notice that the archaea outweigh the protists, animals, and viruses, and even all of them combined. So just this kind of bacteria outweigh all of uh, the animals on Earth. But when we look at the U bacteria, um, even far uh, more uh, than that. And so if we were to talk about life on Earth, I think very often we think of the animals. If you were to say, ah, oh, name a living thing on the planet. I think a lot of us you know, would think of animals uh, first, um, but bacteria outnumber the animals, bacteria outweigh the animals, and not by a little, by a significant amount. Now, plants, because of the great mass of uh, you know, the trunks of trees, uh, that would be this, um, uh, this uh, bar here, plants would be the heaviest uh, amount of biomass. But notice if animals are, you know, two uh, gigatons, archaea would be seven, and bacteria, you bacteria would be 70. So certainly, you know, there is an incredible amount of bacteria on the planet. Just uh, a quick comment. Uh, I, I, we can get back to this. Um, but not only are there bacteria in environments like soil and water, et cetera, um, but as you can see, there are an enormous number of bacteria associated with uh, the human uh, body. So if you were to go into the stomach, per milliliter of stomach juice, there could be between one and 10,000 cells there. Um, but, uh, in the large intestine, for a milliliter of uh, material there. Uh, we're talking about billions of cells to a trillion cells per milliliter.
Um, all of us carry around about, say, two pounds or so of bacteria with our bodies, so many that they outnumber human cells. When you look in the mirror, obviously there are human cells you know, that you see, but in the mass that you call you, the number of bacterial cells actually outweigh the, uh, uh, the uh, I'm sorry, outnumber, not outweigh. Uh, outnumber the human cells, perhaps as much by a factor of 10. Uh, and so uh, there is an incredible number of microbes uh, in the world. And so obviously, if we were going to survey life on Earth, uh, you know, certainly we have to consider these uh, bacteria. Now, one of the other things that make bacteria significant is the type of cell that uh, they uh, have. They are the simplest cells, which is then makes sense why they were the ones which appeared first in history. So when we consider the history of our uh, planet, um, bacteria, uh, many forming stromatolites, um, are known uh, from, uh, you know, starting at 3.5 billion years ago, and perhaps traces a little bit um, uh, uh, older uh, than uh, that. Uh, and so uh, this was the first life of, or, uh, uh, first form of life on Earth, and bacteria were the only living things on our planet for about a third of, uh, of its history, for about a billion and a half uh, years, as we will see. As such, it's not just that as we consider life on Earth, we could should consider bacteria because you know they're a, a, an abundant form of life on Earth. Um, but also they were the first living things. And if we consider life on Earth, life did not start with you know primates or animals uh, or eukaryotes. Um, it was the bacteria which had the planet uh, to themselves for a long time. And as a result, um, much of what we complex animals have um, was first formed in bacteria, all right? So if you look at, well, you know, it was these earliest cells that invented membranes made of phospholipids and cholesterol. Um, we still have membranes like that. It was these early cells which decided to use DNA to encode RNA, which at a ribosome would uh, be translated into protein. We do that to make our proteins, but that was invented by uh, prokaryotes. Um, we can use proteins called G-protein coupled receptors to detect things outside the cell or even light. It was the early cells um, which invented the G-protein coupled receptors to detect things outside cells, including light, and bacteria have them uh, today. Um, we use globins to carry oxygen in our red blood cells. It was prokaryotic cells which invented globins. Uh, and so I could go on and on. But another reason to study that, like let, let's say you were to you know, say, I'm not interested in bacteria, I'm interested in humans. Well, the human complexity was built on a foundation. Long before there were humans, there were bacteria which were experimenting, mutating, inventing new biochemical pathways, et cetera, for a billion and a half years, a third of the history of life. And then it was from these bacteria that higher forms of life evolved, using many of those things which had uh, been first uh, uh, developed in uh, bacteria. And so once again, another reason to study bacteria is because they were the earliest life on earth. A lot of the things that all living things share were then developed by these early prokaryotic cells in um, early earth uh, uh, history. Uh, and so once again, many reasons to start off um, a, uh, a study of uh, life uh, with uh, bacteria. And we learn a lot about our own cells, um, these are, are protists, um, by uh, studying uh, bacteria. When we, you know, uh, a lot of our uh, genes were isolated first in bacteria. A lot of our, uh, you know, biochemical pathways were first studied in bacteria, and then once we understood it there, then we could uh, then apply it to more complex uh, scenarios. And you can compare DNA sequences, and you can see that not only do we have similar uh, genes, <coughs> 
um, but that the sequences show us um, that it was from uh, uh, primitive one-celled organisms that all living things uh, have evolved and that these more complex living things have then uh, simply um, modified uh, the ancestral uh, processes and we can uh, compare gene sequences that uh, many of my genes are present in bacteria, um, but the sequences have changed over time and we can construct uh, genetic uh, uh, trees uh, testing to that. Okay. So um, bacteria are made of cells. All living things are. We consider that to be the foundation of life on Earth. But there are two kinds of cells on Earth. Uh, the kind we may be most familiar with are the kinds that we have, the big complex cells that have a nucleus, membrane-bound organelles like mitochondria and rough endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, there would also then be plant cells made of uh, eukaryotic cells, which include chloroplasts. Fungi are composed of uh, eukaryotic cells, as are amoeba and paramecia. But there is a second type of a cell on Earth called the prokaryotic cell, which lacks the nucleus, lacks the mitochondria, lacks these membrane-bound uh, organelles. In general, these cells are uh, smaller uh, and simpler. Uh, these are prokaryotic cells, what we'd see as the bacteria today. Uh, so a typical bacterial cell is drawn as a mom organ, uh, that's uh, one to the 10 to the minus six uh, meters. Um, so a thousandth of a million, uh, and very often draw them as having, you know, this one single um, uh, chromosome. So this is good, and it's kind of accurate that prokaryotic cells are smaller and simpler than eukaryotic cells. However, one thing I'd like to just quickly overview, and obviously these videos playing in the background are longer than my overview of them, so they go into a bit more detail. Um, bacteria vary so much more than we often um, I give them uh, credit for. So let it be said that uh, it's good to describe a, a typical bacterium as being small, simple, having a you know a, you know a single chromosome, uh, etc. Um, but that being said, there are great variations in bacteria. Not only have they had recent you know, times to diversify. But obviously there was a billion and a half years, a third of the history of life on Earth, where only bacteria uh, existed. And so they uh, clearly diversified a great deal uh, there. And so here I am, I'm going through just some of the variations that we see in bacteria. And then just some of the highlights would be, well, many bacteria or say a micron or two in size, as uh, would be Streptococcus pneumoniae or E. coli. Um, they can be smaller than that. So there are tiny uh, uh, bacteria. And then there are a few bacteria actually big enough to see without a microscope, actually visible to the naked eye. Um, so this one, 750 microns, that's almost a millimeter in size. This one uh, is thinner, um, but once again, almost a millimeter in length. I said there are no membrane-bound organelles in bacteria, but some have such highly folded uh, membranes that it accomplishes almost the same um, uh, result. Uh, when I had said that a typical bacteria is, uh, you know, about a micron or two in size, um, there are some uh, which are much smaller uh, than uh, that. And so once again, uh, I know for a beginning biology student, at some point it's good to say, you know, here's bacteria are like this. Here's an average um, uh, bacteria. Um, but bacteria are incredible incredibly diverse and we sell them short by trying to you know you know package them into the, you know a box where they all look like this so here's just another before i move into other aspects of their variation um, so here you can see e coli um, is you know many uh, two microns long uh, one micron uh, wide rhodospirillum is maybe a micron but if you keep those little images in um, in mind uh, here's nanobacterium, uh, which would be uh, half that, okay? Um, but now I'm going to jump to uh, some of the uh, large ones uh, here that you saw. Some of these other microns, uh, or I'm sorry, these other 
bacteria in their size. So once again, one can speak of bacteria in general, all right, but the differences between them are enormous. Just as animals vary, there are microscopic nematode worms and there are elephants. You know, here we have enormous size differences uh, between these, um, uh, these uh, different bacteria. Um, then uh, moving uh, along, once again, I just want to hit some of the highlights. Um, bacteria vary in everything, and, and so it does them a disservice to say bacteria are all like this. They're not. So for example, let's take their cell membranes and cell walls. Um, cell walls can vary in uh, how thick they are, and this is the cause for the distinction between, say, gram-positive bacteria, whose thicker walls take up a purple stain, versus gram-negative uh, bacteria, where it doesn't, and then can be counter-stained uh, pink. So the gram-positive, gram-negative distinction has to do with the uh, cell walls, which are made of this uh, peptidoglycan. Um, but then there can be other uh, differences as uh, well. For example, the gram-negative bacteria, they have an outer membrane around uh, their, uh, cell, uh, their cell walls. There are bacteria um, which lack cell walls, like mycoplasma. Um, there uh, are bacteria called spirochetes, which would actually be rod-shaped. But if you look, they have a cell membrane, a cell wall, a space, and then an outer membrane. And in this space, they have flagella. And the flagella then causes their uh, shape uh, to uh, form this, um, this shape here, which can be called a spirillum, uh, or uh, if there are uh, or uh, if there are uh, lots of folds, uh, a spirochete. And so bacterial shape can vary a great deal. So you have a round form, that's a coccus, a rod-shaped form, a bacillus. There can be spirilla and uh, spirochetes. Um, and then there are other shapes. In the previous videos, you know, some are uh, rod-shaped uh, and very long and thin. Some are square, almost some are comma-shaped, uh, like uh, Vibrio. Uh, and uh, so therefore, uh, bacteria can vary a great uh, deal. Um, cyanobacteria and Epulolopsychium, uh, that very large bacteria, have a highly infolded um, cellular uh, cell membrane. Um, and so uh, they don't have membrane-bound organelles, um, but you know, the folding of their uh, outer membrane almost approaches that. And maybe I just spoke incorrectly because while eukaryotic cells have a nuclear membrane around their DNA to form a nucleus, there are actually bacteria where it is known that they have a membrane around their DNA. Um, it's not the same as the double nuclear uh, envelope, at least not as far as I've read. Um, uh, but what does that mean? How common is that? Because it's just not something that I, I believe has been thoroughly investigated with all bacteria. So some bacteria actually wrap their DNA in a membrane um, not that unlike eukaryotic uh, cells. So as uh, we're looking at variations in bacteria, um, their shape varies, uh, their size varies, uh, their, um, uh, uh, their cell membranes uh, 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 vary, uh, their cell walls uh, vary, and I'll get to a few other uh, variations as uh, well. Um, their life cycles, or I'm sorry, how they get uh, energy uh, varies. Uh, some are um, uh, using uh, the sun uh, for uh, 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 energy. Some are oxidizing uh, minerals. Uh, some are getting it from organic molecules. We we'll get uh, to uh, all of uh, that um, uh, later. So uh, once again, uh, there are separate videos uh, on on that. Other differences include um, the chromosomes. So for example, I think many people you know, will study, oh, a typical bacterium has one circular chromosome. Um, yes, and, and that's not untrue. Um, but they can have more. They can have two circular chromosomes. They can have linear chromosomes, which is interesting because that's the type of chromosomes that uh, eukaryotes have. Some have a circular chromosome and a linear chromosome. In addition to chromosomal DNA, they can have these extra chromosomal loops known as plasmids. And so uh, the number of uh, plasmids uh, uh, you know, can vary 
a, uh, a great uh, deal. And so, uh, so I, I go through a number of uh, the variations um, uh, in some of these. I'm just getting uh, caught up. Um, and so when we look at the number of genes present in uh, bacteria, um, they can vary a great deal. So uh, the point is, uh, so here we have you know, one linear chromosome, 21 circular chromosomes, thousands of copies of chromosomes in you know, this enormous uh, uh, cell. Um, the number of genes vary. So the point is that while uh, just to get an approximation of uh, bacteria. You know, it's good to say, oh, they're, they're small, they're simple, um, but that is doing the group an injustice because of how uh, big uh, the group is. And when I say group, actually, that's not even true, um, because we split bacteria into two groups, two uh, groups which go back to, as far as we can tell, very early in life's history. Um, so there are uh, the U bacteria, what we typically think of as bacteria. Uh, but then there's a second group called archaea. And they are so different from uh, the U bacteria that they are put in an entirely separate uh, group. How are they different? Uh, well, uh, for one, uh, their uh, cell membranes uh, are made of very different types of um, of lipids. So if you were to look at the cell membrane uh, lipids here, you can see there's branching in the fatty acids uh, in archaea, which you bacteria don't have. There are ether bonds uh, connecting um, uh, the uh, glycerol to fatty acids as opposed to ester bonds. Um, and then very often uh, that instead of having a bilayer of uh, phospholipids, where there's one layer facing this way, one layer facing this way. It forms a monolayer by actually then joining here. And as I'll mention uh, presently, uh, some of the archaea can live in very extreme environments, like very high temperatures. And some of these changes in the uh, cell membrane lipids help anchor them together and make them more stable at uh, higher temperatures. Uh, also, uh, the cell walls of U bacteria, when present, are made of peptidoglycan, um, but archaea have a different type of a cell wall made of pseudomurine. Um, archaea are perhaps best known um, for being among the extremophiles. I'm going to kind of cover extremophiles at uh, the end because while many bacteria uh, many archaea are extremophiles. Some U bacteria are also extremophiles. So this is not just um, uh, unique to archaea, um, but a very large percentage of the archaea live in environments where you would think that life could not exist. Not only does life exist there, but you find living things that need high temperatures, that need great pressures, etc. cetera. Um, uh, once again, this is true of archaea, but also true of some U bacteria as well. And the division between uh, uh, these uh, lineages goes back into uh, early Earth. Now, while when we talk of archaea, once again, perhaps the most famous ones are the ones that live in extreme environments, um, but you can find them elsewhere. So for example, you can find them in seawater, you can find them in intestines, like in that cow, or even ours. And an easy way to know that is because archaea are the only organisms on the planet which can produce methane as a waste product. They are the only methanogens. Not all archaea are uh, methanogens, um, but the only methanogens are uh, archaea. Uh, and so therefore, uh, when uh, we, um, uh, uh, when, uh, you know, we talk about, you know, where they occur, obviously, uh, large intestines of animals, especially, you know, ruminants, uh, but also including humans, being able to produce methane, um, there are uh, archaea living in our large intestines, although they are not the majority. Now, uh, it is significant that archaea thrive at, or many of them thrive at extreme temperature, uh, at ex extreme environments like extreme temperatures. Many um, 
you bacteria do the same. And interestingly, if you were to then make a family tree of life's molecules um, and ask, well, you know, what are the earliest branches of life on Earth? So like the archaea, the earliest branches of you bacteria, what were they like? Because maybe this gives us an idea of what the first living things were like. Well, the earliest branches of archaea are thermophiles and hyperthermophiles, bacteria that live at very high temperatures. The earliest branches of the U bacteria are thermophiles and hyperthermophiles. So not only is it possible that we can find life in very deep places, very hot places. Um, we think that those are the conditions of the early earth. And we think that the earliest living things were thermophiles and hyperthermophiles, um, like the uh, archaea and uh, hyperthermophilic uh, U bacteria today. They may simulate uh, the, uh, the closest approximation we have today of what the earliest life was like. Now, I think it's common uh, for us to like look at something that lives at such high temperatures or pressures as being weird. Well, that's just weird that life lives like that. Um, but then uh, perhaps we could argue that no, that that's kind of normal. Maybe we're weird because once again, that was what the earliest life uh, was uh, like. If you were to look at, um, so for example, the history of life on Earth, um, there wasn't much oxygen in the air until about uh, you know, 2.23 billion years ago. And I'll get to why in a second. Um, and so it's weird for us uh, for life to thrive in an area without oxygen. Um, but that represents you know, arguably you know, much of Earth, perhaps most of where we find living things, as I'll, I'll see. And it also represents half of Earth's uh, history. All right. Uh, and so uh, that, um, you know, it isn't, you know, normal for things to necessarily need um, oxygen. How deep in the earth can we find uh, life? Well, interestingly, um, we can find life as far down as we can look. All right. So this is what's called the subsurface uh, biosphere or the deep biosphere. And subsurface prokaryotes may uh, represent uh, half or even more than half of all prokaryotes and a third of life on Earth. So let me just, you know, kind of, you know, stress that again. Where are living things? When we think about life on Earth, you know, I look out my window, I say, oh, there's some trees, there's some birds, there's, you know, some bugs. That's where life is found. Um, but you can find bacteria in coal uh, uh, deposits. Uh, so deep underground, you can find bacteria in petroleum deposits. You can find bacteria in rock deep underneath the earth. You can find a uh, bacteria at the bottom of uh, the ocean. Everywhere where we have looked, there are um, bacteria. So if you were to say, okay, you know, I'm certainly thinking of life on the surface, uh, here. But if life can then be in the sediments, in the rock even, in petroleum and coal beds, etc., because of how thick the crust is compared to, you know, what we sometimes call the biosphere uh, on the surface, um, it is possible that half of life on Earth, maybe even more than half of all the living things, aren't, you know, here, but rather what's found here. We may be the weird ones living on the surface. Most of life on Earth might actually then be, you know, far uh, deeper. Uh, once again, in areas where there's little or no uh, oxygen, uh, in areas where there's great pressure, uh, in these rocks, and as you approach uh, the core of the Earth, it gets much hotter. So, 80 degrees Celsius, 100 degrees Celsius, and uh, hotter are where these bacteria live all the time, uh, and so. Uh, you know, th when we study, you know, life on Earth, if we're omitting these extreme environments, we might actually be uh, omitting half of life on uh, Earth. You know, we just have estimates of how much uh, life is actually um, uh, of down there. Uh, and, and so I'll leave archaea for now, um, but they are different. Uh, and one of the things is, you know, that some bacteria have flagella, some archaea have flagella. 
but just as the flagellum of a bacterium is different from the flagella of a eukaryote, you know, say like a, uh, uh, a sperm cell uh, were some of the protists of uh, like euglena, uh, which have a flagella. Um, the flagella of archaea and eubacteria are uh, different. Uh, and so some archaea have flagella, some uh, bacteria have flagella, but we should actually use different terms, maybe using the term archaella uh, for uh, archaea because uh, they are completely uh, unrelated. So when we use the term uh, flagella, you know, the archaea, the eubacteria, and the eukaryotes have three completely different, um, uh, uh, different uh, kinds. Um, then finally, uh, we have fossils of one-celled organisms, um, but obviously it's hard to study these and, and to say a great deal about them. But there are chemicals which are unique to archaea that you bacteria don't make. Uh, met, uh, you know, pro uh, the production of methane would be one of, uh, you know, one of those signs, but there are many things which are, you know, the components of, uh, of archaea, but not uh, you bacteria. And so when we dig in very old rocks, um, so if this is the history of life on earth, most of it being known as the Precambrian, all animals are only known from this part here. These other prokaryotes, uh, they are known, um, I, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, so all animals are only known from this portion. Life actually starts about 3.5 billion years uh, ago, somewhere in this um, uh, zone. And um, chemicals which are associated with archaea go back very far. And so we know that there were cells of prokaryotic organisms here, um, but thus then the uh, distinction between the um, uh, archaea and eubacteria seems to go back about that far. So um, both of these kinds of bacteria seem to have been uh, present since the very beginning. And we should talk about it, whether it be in the modern world or the fossils, um, because methane helps to trap heat. It is a greenhouse gas. Um, uh, one uh, kilogram of methane warms the earth as much as 34 kilograms of carbon dioxide. And so thus, uh, if we're studying uh, the conditions of the early earth, its temperature and how that affected life, or if we're concerned about modern climate uh, change, um, then the, um, the amount of uh, archaea uh, producing uh, methane is certainly uh, significant. So once again, I go into um, uh, methane uh, here uh, and uh, the production of methane by uh, methanogens uh, is uh, significant in uh, many uh, environments uh, where oxygen is not present. So uh, the uh, production of methane occurs in swamp mud or in large intestines because oxygen is not uh, present uh, there. Uh, but this then, um, uh, is also important uh, for uh, the uh, climate change, which is currently affecting our uh, Earth. So uh, this was kind of an introduction and a mention of archaea. The next video will continue with the eubacteria and other aspects of, um, of the study of prokaryotes.